Good afternoon. Good evening. This is the Central Asia Caucasus Institute Zoom program today on, and the topic is a very, very significant one, but one which has unfortunately slipped to the side of, of Western consciousness and maybe world attention generally. And that is the long-term impact and uh, of the events in Kazakhstan in January. Th this, this was a, as you recall, uh, this was a, a unfolding three-stage process that began around the 2nd of January uh, for a particular notably laudable reason. The government of Kazakhstan was trying to bring the cost of, of uh, gasoline or fuel for automobiles in line with market, but they did so in one huge jump rather than slowly and steadily. And as a result, tens of thousands of people headed into the street, especially out in the west of the country, which evolved very promptly into a general critique of, of corruption in the government. People saying, well, why are the wealthy who have got gained, many of whom have gained their their, their riches uh, through illegitimate means. Why are they not paying for this? Why are we paying for this? This in turn evolved into as the events moved further and further east, finally reaching Almaty and they're uh, breaking out into, into uh, violence on the street and, and very serious uh, 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 events is, which we'll be hearing about. Now, the question is what happened how was it handled? And what is the long-term impact of these events? Where do we stand today? And of course, uh, so many, so many uh, dramatic developments have taken place since then, especially in Ukraine. Yet we don't want to forget these events. We want to understand them. We want to uh, learn what we can learn from them and uh, proceed on that basis and maybe that will give us some insights as to the current state of Kazakhstan's diplomacy and internal development. So we're very pleased to have an important paper on this, which is available uh, at CACIanalyst.org, CACIanalyst.org. Author, uh, Dr. Svante Cornell, uh, is going to speak to us today. Uh, the title of the paper is Learning from Kazakhstan's January Crisis. And I think if you check in all known languages, this is the most comprehensive and balanced treatment of the subject to appear so far in print. So without further ado, let me turn to Dr. Cornell. Uh, after he has made an initial uh, presentation of his findings. We'll open the, uh, open the uh, discussion to comments and questions from, from our viewers, and I'll have a few of my own as well. Dr. Cornell. Thank you very much. I should say that the, uh, the article is indeed available on CACIanalyst.org under feature articles, as well as on the main website of the Joint Center, uh, silkroadstudies.org. Uh, the the idea, I think, came from two things. First, that the events in Kazakhstan were quickly both overshadowed by and understood uh, through the prism, uh, largely uh, of what was going on in Ukraine at the time. Uh, and we figured that it was important for this to be documented. And therefore, we took a page from uh, 15 years ago when the Institute published a similar paper on the 2007 crisis in Georgia. That was current called Learning from Georgia's Crisis. Um, and it's, uh, this, it, there are two parts of it. One is an analysis and, and conclusions, and the other is a chronology. Uh, it's probably incomplete, but it's uh, as detailed as we uh, managed to, um, uh, to produce on the what precipitated the crisis and the events during and after the crisis itself. Uh, I, should men I should mention that Vlada Kirilenko at AFPC, a uh, research intern, was very much helpful in, in uh, helping us produce this, this chronology. Um, uh, the chronology, of course, I won't go through. Um, people know what happened or they can read the chronology. Uh, I think it provides for certain 
it, it enables you to make some interesting connections about when things are happening and the sequence of things. It's always useful. But I'll focus here on the conclusions, which, uh, which pertain to separate realms. Um, some about the events themselves and Kazakhstan's social evolution, um, the elite politics uh, that are involved in this and what we can glean from it, uh, the, CSTO, the CSTO operation in Kazakhstan's foreign policy, and finally, of course, on implications for US and European policy towards Kazakhstan. And I'll start with the, uh, the, um, the conclusions that I draw concerning Kazakhstan's um, social evolution, if you will, from these events. And I'd like to say at the, the outset that the, the January events must be separated into at least two categories. The first, as Professor Starr mentioned, was the spontaneous public protests that emerged in the west of the country and spread countrywide. And the second is the violent riots that targeted state institutions in Almaty on uh, the evening of January 4 and the night uh, of January 5. Um, I'll get uh, back to this in a minute. But I think it's important to note, and I think the president of Kazakhstan, Kazem Jamar Tokayev, has acknowledged that the root cause of these pro protests is uh, uh, understanding, understandable public dissatisfaction, which has been mounting for quite some time, uh, about inequalities and about mismanagement and about corruption. Uh, and I think the reason that this is happening or happened at, at this time, uh, aside from the obvious trigger in terms of price hikes, is that for the past decade, Kazakhstan's ambitions have not been matched by the perceived reality of much of the country's population. And by ambitions, I mean uh, statements like Kazakhstan will be among the world's 30 most developed countries. Um, what we've seen is that as the uh, following 2014 and the oil price collapse, the uh, general GDP per capita situation in Kazakhstan has declined, which has made the disparity uh, between the country's masses and the ultra rich of the country very obvious. And I think it's also important to note that this is a case, therefore, of relative deprivation or perceived relative deprivation, not absolute deprivation necessarily. Uh, it's also important to note that dissatisfaction and protest movement in Kazakhstan uh, has been rising uh, in parallel with the uh, wide the spread of information technology that made it increasingly visible uh, for everybody in the country who owns a smartphone um, to, um, to see examples of the lavish lifestyle of Kazakhstan's richest people. Um, the dissatisfaction that spread in the country mirrored a bifurcation, if you will, uh, between a, uh, what we call a well-educated liberal urban elite that we Westerners tend to meet when we travel to Kazakhstan, and a much larger, less educated segment of the population that is much more nationalistic, less liberal in inc inclination, by the way, this is a process we saw in Kyrgyzstan a year and a half, two years ago, which led to, which drove a change of government in that country. And we published a separate paper about that. The, um, and I should also note that the, there are researchers that have shown that close to half of the public protests in Central Asia in the past, in recent years, were happening in Kazakhstan. And I think this is also why President Tokayev was furiously pushing economic and political reforms uh, it's my analysis that he was aware that only serious reform could maintain the stability of the country and the continuity of the political system. It's also clear that other influential forces did not appear to share this view. And that brings us to the point of uh, Kazakhstan's elite politics. Um, as I mentioned already, the uh, escalation of violence in Almaty deferred uh, clearly from the earlier protests, um, largely peaceful protests in the, across the country. It also, as many people on the ground noted, including uh, the arrival of a different type of protesters who appear to belong to criminal networks, recognizable figures from the criminal underworld, uh, considerably more aggressive, uh, who targeted government buildings and institutions and government forces with violence. Interestingly, they were not met with a strong police response, and it seems to me that it is unlikely that this type of a challenge against state institutions could emerge spontaneously without being identified in one or another way by the relatively strong security structures of Kazakhstan. Uh, I would go further and argue that following the well-known pattern that we see across the region and which we draw from research we did many years ago about the linkages of organized crime um, to, the, to, 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 uh, to, to state institutions across Central Asia and the Caucasus, you would expect significant criminal gangs to be under the informal control of some one or another influential power broker, 
including possibly in the security structures themselves. Um, we can also note, and this is my second point, that President Tokayev, who is the author of the multi-vector foreign policy of Kazakhstan, saw himself compelled to appeal to the Russian-led CSTO for assistance to stabilize the situation. Um, this step could not have been taken lightly. And it seems to me that the only plausible reasons for this decision is that President Tokayev was uncertain of the loyalty of some of the security structures and law enforcement agencies. To put it otherwise, President Tokayev had to appeal to outside support because he feared that a coup was being plotted and executed against him. Now, the background to this very acute situation lies in what I would call an incomplete transfer of power. As we all know, uh, President Nazarbayev, former President Nazarbayev resigned and uh, th three years ago and left um, the power to the Speaker of the Senate, which was Kasim Jumar Tokayev, who then won a presidential election. Um, now, the, the crucial thing here is to understand that there was a partial transfer of formal political power. And I say partial uh, because Mr. Nazarbayev retained important <clears throat> authority. But the, the key part is that this transfer, even partial of formal power, was not accompanied by any transfer of informal political and economic power, which, as we know, in Central Asia and the Caucasus is, uh, is, is, a, is sometimes as important or more important than formal power. And the result of this was that President Tokayev had to contend with an informal system uh, of the merged political and economic power that is you know, characteristic of post-Soviet societies. Uh, and that in turn is a system that is extremely reluctant to change. And as President Tokayev um, took power, um, whether or not he liked it or President, former President Nazarbayev liked it, a split developed. Uh, and we could see that there were two power centers uh, and on President Tokayev's side was a growing part of the Kazakh elite that realized that the system really needed to change, both for the sake of the country and not less important for the sake of the survival of the system. Uh, on the other side was another group of elites that's, if you will, sat at the top of the, what you could call the pyramids of patronage that emerged during the Nazarbayev era. And over the uh, two years that President Tokayev was trying to promote reforms, it became fairly clear that there were influential forces that were actively obstructing these efforts. Uh, and I think the main uh, reason for this is that unlike uh, Mr. Nazarbayev, President Tokayev launched political reforms in parallel to economic reforms, where Mr. Nazarbayev had focused on economic reforms only with an aim, as he repeatedly stated, of moving to political reform later. At this point, I think it's important to say a word. Um, and in a Rumsfeldian sense, we can talk about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I think a known unknown is Mr. Nazarbayev himself. Uh, <clears throat> what was the role of President Nazarbayev? Uh, we don't know, I think. Uh, we can only speculate. Uh, I'll just know. Uh, Actually, I won't speculate, but I'll, I'll, I'll make the point that in the past, we know that President Nazarbayev, when in power, when he was younger and more strongly in control of the political system, was facing serious challenges in reining in his extended family. It stands to reason that his ability to be the arbiter of this type of disputes within his network, not just his family, but the other uh, oligarchs, if you want to call them that, that depended on him, that his ability to serve as an arbiter between in the, these disputes weakened with time. Uh, there are, the question we cannot answer is, did people in his circles take actions on his orders, against his orders, without his knowledge? assuming that people in the so-called Nazarbayev camp uh, were involved in some form of, um, of actions. Um, so that's a question we cannot answer. Uh, we may at some point in the future, but I wouldn't hold my hope uh, on this. What is beyond doubt is that the unrest after the new year triggered a confrontation within the elite. By his actions during and after the crisis, President Okayev pointed fingers at the Nazarbayev family and specifically toward those in control of the security forces. Uh, I should say a few words about Mr. Karim Asimov, who was the head of the National Security uh, Committee of Kazakhstan, the security structures. Now, Mr. Masimov was one of Kazakhstan's most well-known statesmen, a uh, well-known figure in Washington, DC, and he was one of the key interlocutors of Kazakhstan's external partners. 
Immediately following the CSTO intervention, Mr. Masima was detained on suspicion of treason, and subsequently he was blamed for planning a coup. The government has not presented detailed evidence against Mr. Masimov, and President Tokayev, in his March 16 speech, noted that the investigation remains classified. Um, I would only note here that the case is likely to continue to generate concern among Kazakhstan's external partners, and it is important that it be addressed in a correct manner. Uh, looking at President Tokayev's response again, I think it's important to uh, note what he said uh, and what he didn't say and how that relates to what he did and didn't do. Now, President Tokayev has adopted what I would call a complex, a complicated position in explaining the events that took place. Three parts. Uh, the first, he acknowledges the spontaneous and legitimate nature of peaceful protests. Second, he blamed certain high officials of a either dereliction of duty or a deliberate effort to topple him. Now, third, he also blames international terrorists, quote unquote, for the, uh, for the violence. Now, the second and third parts of this position are not necessarily in contradiction, uh, but the government has yet to present any detailed evidence of an international terrorist plot, much less identified what origin these terrorists had or what ideology they adhere to. And it seems to me that if you look closer at President Tokayev's actions, it suggests that he has acted against internal forces, not external forces, which suggests that the enemy was primarily internal and not external. And my conclusion is that President Tokayev is unwilling or unable to publicly declare the true identity of his adversaries and to publicize the full nature of what he perceives to be the challenge to his authority. And this, it seems to me, is a case because the president does not want an all-out confrontation with these opponents. He's trying to renegotiate the balance of the, again, informal economic and political power in the country. And in order to avoid instability, he appears to allow his opponents uh, a way to save face and to exit the system and perhaps even exit the country. Now, moving on to the uh, Russian-led CSTO operation and to Kazakhstan's foreign policy. Um, it seems to me that the Russian-led intervention was unique in many ways. Uh, it was unique for Kazakhstan. It was also unique for the CSTO, which has never deployed a mission like that before. Uh, but it's also the unique because Russia actually left, which, as we know, doesn't necessarily happen when Russia gets involved in post-Soviet countries. It's also somewhat but counterintuitive, uh, because Mr. Putin and Mr. Nazarbayev had a very close relationship, and Mr. Nazarbayev made much of the fact that he was one of the few world leaders that Mr. Putin actually listened to. Uh, also, Mr. Tokayev and his support for reform diverges very strongly uh, from Putinism, and Mr. Tokayev's stated idea of what he wants Kazakhstan to look like is very different from what uh, Mr. Putin advocates in terms of political model. And as I already mentioned, the appeal to the CSTO was a measure of last resort. Uh, from Moscow's perspective, a successful coup in Kazakhstan could have ex exacerbated the unrest in, in the country. And it seems to me also uh, at a time when Russia was fully focused on its upcoming invasion of Ukraine would have been a strong irritant to its plans, not part of its plans. Um, Alternative theories, of course, have been announced. Um, for example, uh, that President Tokayev and uh, Mr. Putin somehow uh, jointly conspired to rid the country of uh, Mr. Nazarbayev and his family and his external network. Uh, to me, this logic, uh, I can't see the logic of such theories. With what we now know about Russian intentions in Ukraine, this was not the timing for an adventure in Central Asia. And more importantly, from the perspective of Kazakhstan, the damage to the country's reputation um, of stability and of independence would make this a no, non-starter for any Kazakh leadership, particularly, I think, for Mr. Pakaya. What is important is also looking at after what happened after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, many people thought Kazakhstan was now in debt to Russia, but what we've seen is that Kazakhstan refused to support Russia and instead maintain a neutral stance and send humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Uh, there are also media reports that suggest that Kazakhstan turned down Russian requests for troops to join the fighting. Uh, we're not sure uh, of the veracity of these claims, however. 
Economically, of course, Kazakhstan is seeing the effects of the war and of the sanctions. Um, they have an effect on Kazakhstan, even though Kazakhstan is not subject to these sanctions. Uh, it's paying a price for its close economic integration with Russia. And this will hit Kazakhstan's population through currency depreciation, loss of trade opportunities, and loss of employment. And obviously, this will prove an additional uh, and unwanted uh, challenge to the reforms being pursued in the country. Finally, I'd like to say a few words about conclusions that the United States and uh, European Union might draw in terms of how to approach Kazakhstan and, and Central Asia more broadly. Uh, it seems to me that the crisis in Kazakhstan suggests both that there is instability in the elite politics, but also that there is a very strong need for uh, political and economic reform across the region. We've seen countries, governments from uh, Uzbekistan to Kazakhstan and to some extent also Kyrgyzstan embrace the idea of uh, political and economic reforms. Um, this is, I think, the, the protests in Kazakhstan suggest that this is urgent. Um, Mr. Tokayev has promised much deeper changes to the political system, something we'd return to uh, in a later event. Uh, he appears to have strengthened his authority over the political system, which in turn should provide him with a stronger position to implement reforms. Meanwhile, the forces that opposed him have been weakened, but they are not, they have not disappeared. So if the United States and the European Union want Kazakhstan to implement reforms and want to support stability in Central Asia, this is the time to actively support the process of reform, not least through the concrete provision of expertise and assistance. I would also note that this type of engagement is the only way that Western partners would have a strong platform to also engage Kazakhstan on issues of their concern regarding the January events. Um, regional cooperation has been a major uh, feature of Central Asian politics in the past several years. The uh, worsening security situation around the region has, if anything, been a factor that strengthened the consultation among regional leaders. But it is important to recall that the, the previous effort to develop Central Asian cooperation 20 years ago came to an end because Russian President Putin demanded to join the Central Asia Cooperation Organization, first as an observer and then as a full member. And it is, it's easy to imagine a scenario in which Russia tries to strong arm, strong arm the Central Asians once more to prioritize Russian-led Eurasian integration over Central Asian cooperation. Um, the Ukraine war could have this effect. It could also have the opposite effect of strengthening the resolve of Central Asians to, to strengthen their own co cooperation and stability by providing security from inside the region rather than from outside. They will be looking for support from the outside to balance any Russian demands, however. And the US and the EU can play a role by a presence in the region and by backing their efforts to cooperate on a regional level. Specifically for the United States, it must be a priority for the US to appoint an experienced ambassador to Kazakhstan. Uh, it would seem natural also for the EU and US to build on um, the uh, transatlantic coordination that has taken place over Ukraine to also coordinate approaches to Central Asia and their, their support both for security in the region and for the reform process going on in several countries. It seems to me that in this context, a key area should be Western support for security institutions. Uh, security institutions have largely stayed outside of the realm of Western assistance. Now, President Tokayev has removed the leadership of security institutions, but wholesale reform is likely to be needed to turn these into, uh, should we say, modern entities that serve the people rather than an unaccountable state within a state which um, security services in this region uh, tend to be, as Professor Starr and myself has, have written about previously. Last but not least, I would say that there will need to be measures by the US and EU to alleviate the effect of uh, sanctions on Russia on not just Kazakhstan, but the Central Asian region more broadly. And this is something we're also going to, to come back to uh, in, in, at the Central Asia Caucasus Institute. How this should be done must be negotiated with Central Asian partners. But I think it's very important for the West not to be indifferent to the economic downturn that is beginning in the region, which of course is going to have an effect both in stability uh, and on any hope for serious reform. I'll stop here, thank you. We can't hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very uh, comprehensive and, and uh, dense presentation.
uh, it gives rise to to many further questions. But let me let me start with this one. Uh, there have been crises before in, in Kazakhstan. There have been difficult phases and so on. It, it's easy to just hope that history time moves on and events are received in the past. Do you think that's going to happen in this case or are they actually are the unresolved issues actually going to be addressed? You identified several of them, the question of uh, uh, of foreign engagement, the question of the status of the security services, et cetera, et cetera, and of individuals. Are these going to be faced uh, directly or are, are they going to be finessed? I think it's hard to say, but it seems to me that some will be faced and some will be finessed. <clears throat> it's the, the challenges are so manifold. Uh, and in so many areas that it seems to me that it's difficult for the political elites to face them all at the same time, because each time you um, confront a challenge, you confront people who want to maintain the status quo. Can you confront all of these at the same time? That's what President Saakashvili tried to do in Georgia. It, in spite of Georgia being a much smaller country with a much bigger, uh, you know, if you will, Western educated elite, uh, he only was able to take it so far and really to succeed in some institutions, but not in other institutions, which suggests to me that the likelihood that Kazakhstan, that President Tokayev would be able to, to face all these challenges in all sectors at the same time is very difficult. He's going to have to do it sequentially, and he's doing it in a situation in which uh, the uh, geopolitical reality surrounding him is, is very unfavorable. It seems to me that what he the one he will he, he he is finessing in a way is the fact that you know there is still the in for the merger of economic and political power informally as I mentioned which again is the case in every post-soviet society um, is something that would be very difficult to face directly and confront in Kazakhstan if not if nothing else because the economy is so large um, the are, there are really two ways of confronting this challenge. One is to simply appropriate all the resources and centralize control over the economic the assets of the country, as well as over the political system. This has been tried elsewhere. <clears throat> that does not mean necessarily that you reform the system. The other alternative is to make the system transparent and strengthen state institutions. It seems to me that President Tokayev is, is focusing on the strengthening of state institutions while not willing to confront directly the, the informal uh, power brokers of the country. Some of them he has confronted and basically forced to withdraw from the system. Uh, I think he, he feels that it's impossible to confront all of them at the same time. This has to be done gradually. The, the, the system has to be institutionalized, if you will, gradually, not directly. Um, Foreign policy-wise, I think it's everybody's in a waiting mode in the region, it seems to me. People are uh, waiting to see what will happen. Uh, what will happen in Ukraine? How is the reaction to Ukraine going to be? Um, and what, what is the Russian approach to, the, to, the, to Central Asia going to be? So I think in terms of uh, foreign policy, we've seen an attempt to, so to speak, uh, strengthen the or reiterate the multi-vector foreign policy and the continuity with the past. Uh, but it seems to me that that's, uh, that's one where we still have to wait and see what happens. A very quick question about CSTO. They're radically different interpretations. One is widely uh, published uh, around the world is that, that uh, Kazakhstan basically folded on this. They, in desperation, Takayev had to had to bring them in. The other view is yes, he he, he was in a uh, in a corner, but he managed to arrange it such that they they came and they left and they left quickly and without without shooting anyone. Um, mm -hmm. Now, who who is owed what after uh, after this? I don't know. I don't know that necessarily anybody has known anything. Uh, owed anything, and it may be that Kazakhstan and Russia have very different views on this. Uh, I think in Russia, there, I'm, I'm assuming there must be a sense that we gave, we did you a favor, therefore you owe us. Um, I don't necessarily think this is the view in Kazakhstan. I think the Kazakhstani government, of course, uh, would have preferred, and I think President Tokayev has made it clear that he would have preferred not to make this stuff. 
but having done so, uh, it seems to me that he uh, feels that, well, Russia didn't act to, to do anybody any favors, but Russia acted because Russia too didn't want any instability and chaos in Kazakhstan. Uh, I think there are all, it's also important to look at other factors, namely the fact that China made it very clear that it did not want any extended foreign presence in Kazakhstan. And it may very well be that Mr. Tokayev, uh, being a sinologist himself, was from the beginning very well aware of the fact that um, China would not uh, support and would actually actively counter any long-term Russian presence in the country. And this made it possible for him to make to, to, to take that step without necessarily falling into a debt trap with Russia. Very interesting. And that addresses one of the questions from our viewers. And, and thank you for doing so. Let me, let me turn to a different question and also one that our, a, a viewer has raised. And that is, what kind of reforms are Mr. Takayev are on his likely agenda? Uh, you mentioned strengthening local institutions, institutions, state institutions at the local level. This, this implies administrative decentralization. Uh, in other words, strengthening the role of the Akims, of the governors, and so on and giving them more autonomy to, to initiate and so on and responsibility. Does it also, do, do you see any indication in the aftermath of the January events that Mr. Takayev is sympathetic to actual increasing the role of self-government? As oh. opposed, in other words, citizen participation at the local level and what kind of institutions might accomplish that? Well, I think, first of all, this was the case even before uh, this crisis. We published a paper last year, um, I think last year, about the political and economic reforms of Mr. Tokayev. And it is very clear that part of the reforms, the idea of, uh, to speak, you know, freely, um, uh, Kazakhstan's political system, Western partners very often suggest you know, that reform take place and changes to elections take place from, from, from the top, from the most important, most sensitive, namely the presidential elections. The Kazakhs' uh, approach under Mr. Tokayev has been the opposite, namely to build political participation from a lower level. Uh, we can discuss the, you know, the reforms that were made, including the, the introduction of direct elections at certain local level elections which may or may not, you know, create genuine political participation. Uh, what seems to me clear after these events and by the, in, the, in his March 16 speech, and we'll be returning to this in a, in a later paper that we're working on, uh, Mr. Tokayev speaks very directly about the, the super presidential system that exists in Kazakhstan and his interest in abolishing this, uh, also in decoupling the president from political parties. He's resigned from the ruling party and he wants to introduce legal requirements that the president of the country is not part of a political system. Um, also uh, introducing reforms to making it easier to start political parties and uh, for independent candidates that are not part of political parties to be elected and so on and so forth. So I think that the, the basic answer is yes. Uh, I think this is the case also for several reasons. Most clearly that I think, in a way, there are many things that are different for before and after this crisis. Of course, on one hand, Mr. Tokayev's position has been strengthened within the elite. That doesn't mean that his position has necessarily been strengthened within society. Now, the reform, the, the protests that took place in January were not against him. They were primarily directed at Mr. Nazarbayev but they were not for Mr. Tokayev either. Uh, and if the protests are neither for or against you, that's potentially a problem. And it suggests that Mr. Tokayev has the benefit of the doubt. Um, people want to see what he, he will be able to achieve. But I think he is also acutely aware of the demands in society for greater liberalization and greater uh, political participation. And he's trying to find ways to achieve this while maintaining political stability in this complicated, of course, geopolitical environment. I think that's the best answer I can give. Ambassador George Kroll has raised a question, uh, 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 and it's an important one. And that is, in terms of, in the process of domestic reform, especially the uh, 
uh, the governance issues that you were just touching upon. Will Russia and China seek to thwart these reforms generally, or and will they seek to thwart any American or Western uh, involvement with them? And if so, where does that leave us? I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's. The, so take China first. Uh, China traditionally uh, uh, can be called a free rider in, in the sense that China would actually, Chinese companies and Chinese government companies find it very difficult to do business in Central Asia because of the opacity of the uh, corruption and of the, um, you know, the type of system of merged political and economic power that I mentioned. Uh, and Chinese uh, academics have actually made the point that China actually finds what the US and EU are trying to do in Central Asia to be quite useful, even for China. Now, that is the case if it supports government efficiency. Now, if these reforms would go further uh, in the direction of actual democracy, I think that would be different. I think Ch China would not necessarily support that. In fact, China would probably actually oppose that, very particularly because of the, uh, the Uyghur issue that China would understand that the Uyghur cause has a very strong resonance in Central Asian societies and any form of democratization in Central Asia would lead to greater support for the Uyghurs. Uh, I think that would, that's the overarching reason why China would not support that. But as long as reforms are focused mainly on supporting government efficiency, uh, I don't see uh, China really uh, opposing it. In fact, they might, they might actually passively welcome it. Russia, of course, is a different situation. But it seems to me that the, um, the, uh, the Central Asians have decided, at least Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have decided that they need to, 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 embrace, to, to engage in reform, no matter what anybody on the outside thinks. Now, of course, yes, this is going to make their systems different from Russia, more different from Russia. But I think they, again, view the Russian red line to be political uh, democracy rather than government efficiency. So as long as we're talking about reforms that focus on good governance, which I think at this point is the only thing that is realistic to expect in Central Asia. First, it seems to me that the Central Asians will be able to manage any kind of reaction from Russia. And second, there is only one place to turn for support and assistance of this type of reforms. It is the Western-led international organizations and Western governments directly. Well, let me ask an economic question. The Kremlin has recently underscored the fact that it believes it has a window uh, to avoid sanctions, namely trade through Kazakhstan. They've been very, very blunt about it, very direct about it. Um, it, it. Is this something the Kazakhs will accede to, especially given the uh, complex interrelations that uh, arose from the events in January. I think the Kazakh position is fairly clear, but also fairly difficult, which is to the extent that they do not directly um, violate sanctions, they would like to maintain trade relations with Russia. And besides, they are integrated with Russia uh, economically through the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, at the same time, they don't want this relationship with Russia to put them in trouble in terms of Western sanctions. I think Kazakh uh, leaders, uh, assistance to the president uh, and, and the deputy foreign minister have been very clear that they will abide by sanctions. And if there is a new Iron Curtain, they do not want to be behind it. I think that's the exact formulation of Deputy Foreign Minister Vasilenko recently to a European uh, news outlet. Uh, so how to do this in practice becomes the question. It's no, by no means easy. It might not even be possible. Uh, and that depends on how the, uh, the uh, sanctions regime evolves. It's not likely to get weaker. If anything, it's likely to get stronger. Uh, Kazakhstan obtained, for example, a, a, a waiver on its oil exports, but that really hasn't enabled them to freely export their oil through Russia as they might have expected. Um, it seems to me also that, by the way, a Kazakh uh, senior official recently stated that 
I think it was about yogurt. He says, I don't know if I can trade yogurt with Russia or not. I don't know if this is a violation of sanctions or if it isn't. So there are a lot of things that are unclear. And I think the, the Kazakhs are trying to figure out right now, what is it they can get, what is it they can do? What is it they can get away with? And what is it that they should absolutely not do? January events, again, inevitably a crisis of this depth uh, caused the attention of the country, of the populace, and of its leaders to turn on itself, to focus on their own affairs, uh, maybe at the expense of all their foreign relations, but especially at the expense of their relations with their neighbors in Central Asia. Is one of the leg is this legacy continuing? Is has has the a diarchy that has grown up with the with the formal relationship uh, of <coughs> allies between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan uh, it, <coughs> is this now going to basically tip in uh, in Uzbekistan's favor that Uzbekistan is left with the role of leadership because Kazakhstan is not in a position to exercise it fully today or somehow will Will Kazakhstan post January, uh, will it somehow re-engage in an active way as a uh, builder of Central Asia coordination and cooperation? Well, I think there are several aspects of this. The, the first aspect is the, Of course, the, the January events weak, weakened Kazakhstan, of course, at least temporarily. More importantly, it struck a body blow to the uh, assertions by both Kazakh and Uzbek leaders in the past that we can take care of problem in Central Asia by ourselves. Thank you very much. This was the message that both Presidents Mirziyoyev and Nazarbayev had been sending uh, to the Russians at various occasions that we don't need outside intervention in Central Asia. We Central Asians are, you know, masters of our own home. We can handle any problem in this region by ourselves. The fact that Kazakhstan was forced to appeal to an outside actor for support, of course, was a major setback to this ambition of managing Central Asian affairs by Central Asians. That doesn't mean it's dead, uh, of course. That means, uh, you know, I think the, the, the ambition, the the aim of the Central Asians is exactly this. Still, on the question of whether Kazakhstan's ability to lead in Central Asia is being compromised, I don't know that this is the case. Somebody would have to prove to me in actual fact that this, this has happened. If, if Kazakhstan would have changed its foreign policy, uh, that may have been the case. But Central Asia, uh, Af Kazakhstan has not appeared to change its foreign policy in any uh, visible way. As for Uzbekistan, obviously it seems it stands to reason that if Kazakhstan is weak and Uzbekistan would emerge as a stronger leader in Central Asia. But I think what's important to note is that this very question presupposes a kind of rivalry for leadership. And in many years past, we had this uh, continuous discussion, many by outsiders of the, of the rivalry between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, between Nazarbayev and Karimov. And, who knows? There may have been some elements to this in the past, but I think what is absolutely clear um, since the arrival of Mr. Mirziyoyev to power is that there is no such sense that we are the Uzbeks against the Kazakhs. I think there is a very clear understanding, actually by both parties, that the world is so complicated and dangerous that we can't afford to have little squabbles about who is the biggest horse in Central Asia. Uh, we have to do this together. And I think there is a full realization in Uzbekistan that if anything, they have to help the Kazakhs maintain the, if you will, the, the partnership in, in leading uh, the development and of cooperation in Central Asia. And I see no reason, I don't see it at all. There are any signs that Uzbekistan would suddenly, you know, utilize the situation to uh, proclaim itself or act as the sole leader of the region. Quite to the contrary, I see that they would continue to emphasize the partnership with Kazakhstan and the others, including Turkmenistan, in doing this. Let, let, let us hope that that's the case. I, I personally agree very strongly that it is. However, the fact is 
Kazakhstan may be so involved with its own affairs for the time being that by default, it plays a less active role. That's the question. Now, let me turn to an entirely different issue, and that is uh, political parties. Another of our viewers, we have very active uh, viewership today, uh, asks, well, what is, what does January 6th and the, and the legacy of it mean in terms of the rise of really competitive elections? Nobody knows, but I think what is clear, I mean, maybe it's not clear. My interpretation of President Tokayev's reforms and or actually his statements on March 16, which in many cases have to be implemented as real reforms, is that he understands that the present situation in which only, you know, a couple of pro-government uh, nominal opposition, not, I shouldn't say pro-government, but a number of nominal opposition parties that are tolerated by the government, are accepted and are allowed to participate in the political system, that's not enough. This does not provide the avenue for political participation and for voice that the people of Kazakhstan clearly demand. Um, so the question is how to open up the political system by, uh, or I should rather say, then the, the fact is that what, what you would call a non-systemic opposition, the political opposition that is partly directed by uh, exiled oligarchs abroad, are not accepted in the political system. I see no uh, way that they will be accepted into the political system. So what I see to be the, uh, the likely way forward is that the government will try to open up a system for the creation of new political forces that are not in any way affiliated with parties that are perceived to be loyal to the government, but at the same time will be make, make, very, make very clear that these new forces that emerge are not going to be fall under the control of, uh, you know, enemies of the state that are abroad. Uh, how they're going to do this, who is going to be the leader of these new political forces, how much the government is going to interfere in the formation or monitor and supervise the, the, the emergence of such political forces, I really don't know. So, I don't see Kazakhstan really opening to a fully competitive political system. And I think Mr. Tokayev has been clear that change will be gradual. Kazakhstan is not going to open up everything tomorrow. At the same time, I think uh, we will see a greater avenue for choice. It will still be limited, but I think it will be far greater than it is today if President Tokayev gets his way. Now, there has been a lot of theorizing, hypothesizing to be uh, a little more elegant about it, uh, about the meaning of events uh, in Kazakhstan, in the former Soviet space, including Ukraine. <clears throat> and I, I want to raise this hypothesis, namely that it has been suggested that 1991 really didn't end the Soviet Union. It, it, it brought us in, in Russia and many other places, um, surprisingly Soviet-like states, which may be ruling uh, uh, independent countries by that point, but nonetheless, uh, more or less striking continuities existed uh, uh, and most conspicu conspicuously in Russia itself. This, line of thinking leads some people today to say to say that what we are witnessing now in this new year 2022 what we are witnessing is finally the breakup of the soviet union not only as a geopolitical entity but uh, as a, a, as a political philosophy that this is that this represents a profound break it's just beginning it's not over and it might be, and it's to be, one might expect it to be reflected in all the various uh, post-Soviet countries that came out of uh, for, former territory of, of the USSR. Now, is there, is there a case for this? Do, do you see this as a fundamental change? I, I'm back to your wonderful paper, which I strongly recommend to all our, all our viewers. Uh, your wonderful paper on the January events, rethinking them. Well, rethinking them big, are they part of a really fundamental shift away from Soviet models? Well, I would put it a little differently. I think the model that emerged across the former Soviet Union was not necessarily a Soviet model. 
it had continuity with the Soviet model, but the the transformation of the uh, economy and the political and the political system at the same time created this particular post-Soviet model of a, what I call the merger of political and economic power. That, to some extent, there's yes, that's a continuity, but I wouldn't say that that's exactly what we had in the Soviet system, uh, because that was state controlled. In, in this case, it's a privatized in many ways um, power over economic uh, of, over economic institutions. Never mind. Assuming that that's what we're talking about, uh, that this particular post-Soviet model is re is an, nearing an end. I'm not sure we're there yet. I think there are, what is happening is, I think what is clearly happening is that in many countries, it is becoming clear that this particular model that emerged with the collapse of the Soviet Union is no longer sustainable. That I agree with. What are they going to replace it by? How are they going to replace it? That is a question, which I don't think there is nothing anywhere near an answer to. There is going to be, um, as I said, different models in different countries. In Georgia, there was an attempt to completely reform the model, a state-led effort to do so. It backfired, and now we have the reinstitutionalization of, uh, of the oligarch control over the country. Um, in countries like Azerbaijan, basically the state has taken control over the economy. In, uh, in, uh, and the oligarchs, most of the oligarchs have simply been um, thrown out of the system. In Kazakhstan, what is going to happen, President? In both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, the leadership wants to reform the system. I don't think it's clear what they want to achieve. The, the end goal that they want to achieve in terms of what they want to reform is not clear to me. Uh, they have, again, so my answer is there is a widespread understanding that the, the current system is not sustainable, but we don't know what is going to follow. We've had a very careful review of the events of January 2022 in Kazakhstan this morning, and it has given rise to a very complex picture of, of evolutionary change, which is now being pushed forward by events on the ground and events elsewhere, including in Ukraine, of course. How to look at this? Well, we're going to continue the, the, this big inquiry. Um, probably in, in the week of the 23rd of this month, we're going to have people from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, offer their insights on the evolution and, and in some cases very intense evolution of policy and practice uh, in the former Soviet states of the, uh, uh, that are now sovereign entities uh, in light of Ukraine. And this should be a very, very significant uh, discussion and we invite you all to come. However, before before closing it down, let me let me suggest that that what we're experiencing is the yes, the end of something. It may not be the end of a post-Soviet uh, 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 or arrangement, which occurred at different characteristics in each country, but nonetheless with some common characteristics. I, I would suggest it's, it, it, it's something in the realm of psychology, something in the realm of, of generational evolution of change, something in the realm of, of new information, the permeability of all information borders today, et cetera, et cetera. And if that's the case, and, the, and if the events in January and especially the government's response to them somehow reflect a, a new approach to, to these matters, then maybe we can say that we are in the beginning of the end of a period of hangover, pachmiel in Russian. I think it's very, very, very fitting that the uh, uh, so so uh, apt a term as a hangover should be used to describe uh, 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 the development of post-Soviet states, in, 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 in including Russia itself. Well, hangovers 
can be very painful and they can go on for quite a while but in the end in the end they do pass and and let's hope that that's the situation in this case and that a, a something really fundamentally new uh, emerges however cautiously however step by step but something uh, positive and new emerges not just in Kazakhstan but across Central Asia the Caucasus and who knows even in Russia so thank you all very very much we'll be back in touch with week of the 23rd IMF and Central Asia and the Caucasus